My name is Rob Corliss, and this talk is entitled Mathematics on Shifting Sand. Before I begin, I want to tell you a little bit about Maple Transactions. Maple Transactions is a new open access journal with no article page charges. So the purpose uh, of the journal is dissemination of excellent expositions on topics of interest to the Maple community. Focus is on computer-assisted research in mathematics, applications in education. As Judy Ann put it, it's karma in a journal. Uh, use of Maple is not a prerequisite. Uh, an exposition might be in the form of a standard PDF. We have a, a LaTeX template on Overleaf, or it might be a video, or it might be a live document. Now, the kinds of live documents that we've published so far include um, Maple worksheets. What I'm going to show you today, another kind of live document. <coughs> Before I begin, I want to uh, show you where the title came from. The title is Mathematics on Shifting Sand. It's an homage to a paper by uh, Velvel Kahan called Mathematics Written on Sand. You can get a copy of that on his website. Uh, along with many other of his research notes and papers. He's a firm believer in open access, and uh, I've benefited greatly. His papers are beautifully written, and so uh, if you haven't read any of them, please drop in and, and uh, to his website and enjoy. So this one, Mathematics Written on, in Sand, was 1983, and he retyped it in about 2001 and put it uh, up on his website. So I'm going to read you one little bit in here. So rather than have to copy the received word, students are entitled to experiment with mathematical phenomena, discover more of them, and then read how our predecessors discovered even more. Students need inexpensive apparatus, uh, analogous to the instruments and glassware in physics and chemistry laboratories, but designed to combat the drudgery that inhibits exploration. So that was written 40 years ago more or less, and things have changed. The sands have shifted in, the, in that time. Uh, in the 90s, uh, at the Center for Experimental and Constructive Mathematics, I participated in the Organic Mathematics Project where we were trying to bring live mathematics and live mathematics exposition to the web. And some of our aspirations have now happened, uh, but today I'm really gonna be talking more about uh, the continually shifting sand aspect of that. So what is it exactly that I'm going to be telling you about? I am going to be talking to you about our project, Computational Discovery on Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is the a name for an uh, interactive notebook style for originally for Python, but now connected to many languages, including Maple. I'm going to be using Python in uh, today's lecture. This book here is Computational Discovery on Jupiter using Python. Uh, the Maple version's in the works, but you, there's connections to Julia or Mathematica or lots of other kinds of things as well. It's an interface more than anything else. Jupyter notebooks are an interface to these things. And they're very, very widely used in modern science. They're free to share. They're convenient. Uh, you'll see some of the things that they, they have. But what I'm using here is not actually Jupyter Notebook. Uh, we have built our, our project using Jupyter Notebooks, but there's a translation tool that translates Jupyter Notebooks into something called a Jupyter Book. And Jupyter Books can be freely shared on the web. So I'll, as an example, I'll show you some, uh, uh, a book, Fundamentals of Numerical Computation by Toby Driscoll and uh, Richard Braun, which is an excellent numerical analysis textbook, and it is freely available on the web. And it's also available in a printed form uh, published by Siam. And I'm very pleased to say that our book, uh, Welcome to, to, pardon me, Computational Discovery on Jupiter, and uh, we've also got a contract with Siam and we are to deliver uh, a version to them next month and version 2.0 is very nearly ready and that's what I'll be demonstrating is version 2.0. Version 1.0 is already on the web so you could just google search computational discovery on Jupiter and see what version 1.0 is. 
And this idea of something being freely available uh, is, is aspirational for all of us. And there's some interesting things to talk about with that. So clearly there's some effort involved here. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about our, my co-authors. So go down and see about the authors. So you probably know Neil Kalkin and you may know Eunice Chen. Neil Kalkin is at, at Clemson University. Uh, Eunice is at the Chinese University of Hong Kong in Shenzhen. Uh, she was my PhD student at Western, and she, but she's uh, uh, now tenure track at uh, CHUK. And well, uh, there's me. So that's, that's us. Uh, we've been working fairly hard on this project. And the question is why, what, what, what are our goals? What do we want to do here? Um, we taught Eunice and I taught a, a course at Western, uh, related to this material and it was a, a course that was uh, mixing first year students and senior students, including graduate students and in the same course on experimental mathematics. And Neil has a more senior level course at Clemson, um, again, an experimental mathematics course, uh, but they share a uh, common outlook. One uh, common outlook is that we want to encourage the students to ask their own questions uh, and encourage understanding computational discovery, experimental mathematics as a part of a discipline. Be this was, a, of course, a very old uh, discipline. Uh, the masters all used it. Uh, uh, Newton used experimental mathematics. Uh, there's a lovely letter of his to Leibniz where he talks about uh, uh, powers of 11. Uh, Stephen Strogatz has got a recent article on in Quanta magazine uh, about that letter. It's worth, well worth reading that. So yes, we want to teach experimental uh, mathematics because it's largely missing from our curriculum nowadays. We, deserve, we think it deserves a larger place than it has. But we also want to respond to some student uh, expressed wishes and, ex and student needs. One of them is students have asked for more programming. Mathematicians, uh, some mathematicians think programming is beneath them. Some uh, mathematicians think it think it's irrelevant to what they want. But by and large, the public expects mathematicians to be able to program. And the recent rise of machine learning and uh, uh, big data, all these kinds of things, show that there are actual employment opportunities, and the students respond to that. They want more programming, more experienced programming. This, uh, these works are not programming courses per se, but what we're trying to do is not teach programming per se, but introduce people to programming, introduce people to programming using mathematics. This students have also said in wide surveys that they want more, more control of the curriculum. So this OER is designed to be used um, dipping in. There's some things that you need to do to start with, but pick and choose from, what, from what's left. And the students are allowed to choose, encouraged to choose, encouraged to create their own Bits. We would love it if uh, future editions of this stuff had more student contributed content, for instance. Uh, another thing is students want to be more connected to the research, the research frontier. They want to get there as fast as possible. So this picture here that we're looking at, this infinite number of infinity symbols, is from a paper uh, by a student. Her name is Ao Li. Uh, who solved the problem that we thought was open in the class. It's like, not just, you know, here's a problem, go away and work on it. She solved it in class. So I thought that was pretty good. Um, and yes, we got a paper out of that. And this figure is from that paper. So it can happen. And we'll show you some other pictures of uh, things that are completely novel and students got to participate in the research activity maybe not in a level of publishing a paper, but still got to participate. So we have that as well. Another thing that the Western course did was we, the students got essay course credits for it. The Faculty of Science, uh, or pardon me, the university has a, a essay course requirement, a certain number of essay credits to, to, to graduate. And all right, here's one way to recognize within the mathematics uh, curriculum 
some essay like development. So the, we evaluated the students on the basis of reports on projects. And so of course there was the written part of the project, but more than that, I think writing computer programs itself fills some of the same mental space as writing an essay does. You write a good essay, it should be logical, it should be clear, it should be well organized. And if you write a program, well, you have to do that too. So there, there are some of the same skills that are being exercised. Some of the same skills are being exercised in proof as well. So those, they're, they're, it's interesting how those things come together. The most important thing though, is one of the things is missing from mathematics standard curriculum is fun. If we can make the material more fun and more engaging and the learning more active, then we can actually reach more people and we can actually uh, reach some of the people that we traditionally turn off to mathematics. People say, oh, I hate that course and they never come back again. And then later they, in life, they may, you know, well enjoy doing Sudoku or other mathematically flavored puzzles and not realize that there was some of that kind of uh, joy, uh, pure joy that you could find in mathematics. So those were our goals. All right, enough talking about that. Let's uh, show you some of it. Let's show you Jupyter Notebook. I'm going to choose out a couple of the units in here. We have several chapters to choose from. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Fibonacci number chapter, which is not in version 1.0. So if you find the 1.0 version on the web, this is this computing with Fibonacci numbers is not there. And if I have time, I'll talk about the Bohemian matrix unit. But there's lots of things that I could choose to, to talk about in here. So let's have a look at computing with Fibonacci numbers. So if we go to uh, Competing with Fibonacci numbers, this is our first unit. The main purpose, we want to begin to teach computational discovery as quickly as possible and simultaneously induce the active reader to start the program in Python. So if you look at this, you'll see that we've got table of contents for the whole book on the left. And if you look over here, we have table of contents uh, for this particular unit on the right. So we can go and look at various, this is how Jupyter book looks like and we can go and look at you know some of the uh, formulas you see ordinary mathematics kind of notation uh, but this is html so this the math is being displayed with math checks uh, and it works in almost all the browsers now so uh, this is chrome that i'm displaying it on but it works in microsoft edge and uh, unis uses mac and safari that works just fine <coughs> There's lots and lots of stuff that we want to talk about in uh, any unit on the Fibonacci numbers. And one of them is we want to put them in a proper historical context. This again helps to make things more fun for students. A more satisfying educational experience to put placement in here and recognizing that Pangala uh, in the third century BCE was working, had discovered Fibonacci numbers in his analysis of Sanskrit poetry is something that people like to learn. And uh, although we're not ever going to be able to change the universal nomenclature of Fibonacci numbers, it's just too many papers, books, and journals that call them that, at least we can acknowledge the greater historical depth uh, in which these are found. Uh, so we have a little unit on that. So this is Jupyter book that I'm showing you. That, uh, uh, let's look at the notebooks themselves. Let's look at, this is the Jupyter notebook that we write. And this is the thing that can be con connected to Python. This one's connected to Python. So this Jupyter notebook contains uh, math. It contains code. Uh, it, the, uh, it's a read eval, uh, print loop, a standard thing, but embedded in a nice way. So that you could put text in it, we could put data, you could include the programs themselves. Uh, we have a fairly gentle and scaffolded introduction. The math is written in Markdown, which is a subset of or a cut down version of LaTeX. So mathematicians typically can learn Markdown immediately. Uh, so that's what that looks like. That's how we write these kinds of things. I do want to uh, show you one set of graphs from here. Uh, here's the something that we do uh, more at a senior level, more at a graduate level, is continuous Fibonacci numbers, although that's 
there's a wonderful video by Stand Up Maths, which we link to, that talks about this. Continuous interpolating the Fibonacci numbers is, is something that uh, has got a lot of attention from a lot of people because just an interesting kind of topic. Here's a way to do it with purely real answers. So once you look at this, you realize, wait, there's a question we can ask. We can ask, when is a Fibonacci number equal to zero? So you can look for the zeros of the Fibonacci numbers. And in the real line, they're interesting enough. Uh, it's hard to see that there's two real zeros near zero, but one is zero and there's another one about minus 0 0.01. Uh, and then thereafter, there are zeros that approach the negative half integers, which is kind of interesting. And that's obvious from the graph, but maybe complex zeros. So if we want to look at complex zeros, what we want to do is draw a phase portrait. And this is a piece of technology which is new. It might be new to you. It was new to me uh, only a few years ago. It's a lovely book by Elias Wiegert called uh, Visualizing Visual Complex Analysis. And the main trick there is that if you draw a phase portrait, then you can actually learn quite a bit about complex functions. So this is the phase portrait for uh, the continuous interpolant of the Fibonacci numbers. And as far as I can tell, this is a new result. I've got four black dots in here, which uh, are from an asymptotic solution to the f of t equals zero. And as far as I can tell, that's a new result. And it really comes about by looking at the, the new tools. The, the phase portrait is not new technology. It's a new way of using technology. It's a, it uses color to represent the uh, uh, complex valued function. So how does that work? Let me just tell you very briefly how that works. Uh, I'll do that in Maple rather than in, in Python. There's the uh, phase portrait for the continuous interpolant of the uh, Fibonacci numbers. How it works is we use a phase color. This is the phase portrait of the simple function uh, z, f of z equals z. So that has a zero at zero. And what you see with the color of the phase of z, oh, well, that's just theta. And we've got a different color assigned to different values of, of theta, where z equals um, r e to the i theta. So everything with that angle theta has the same color. And you see that we get a, a progression, light blue, blue, fuchsia, red, yellow, green, going in a counterclockwise way around the zero. That property is kept when you do a mapping and you do the plotting of the phase, you get exactly that uh, progression of colors around any zero. And so there's blue, dark blue, fuchsia, red, yellow, green. So there is a zero right there. Uh, there is another zero right there. If the colors were going clockwise instead of counterclockwise, then we would have found a pole, not a zero. That's because it's uh, e to the minus theta, right? So uh, that's easy to explain to people who know their complex variable theory. Uh, but what's shocking about it is that it's so visible. You can actually see zeros and poles and, and uh, branch cuts and all these kinds of things. It's perfectly possible to visualize complex functions, which until maybe five years ago, maybe, maybe 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, if you were rich and had really good color screen. It, uh, it was possible, but hasn't really percolated into the education, uh, into, into the curriculum yet. But inexpensive, fast to do, uh, away we go. So there's something that we can have actually in a first year curriculum and the students like them because they're fun pictures and they can go and make their own discoveries that way. All right, I want to talk a little bit about Bohemian matrices as well. Uh, oh yes, by the way, that this is our solutions to the problems. And if you want to go back to the activity, we go back to the to the uh, uh, main unit. We have a link back to the to that unit. And this was in the graduate activities because, as I said, we mixed graduate students with with uh, first year students, we had a little enrichment material for them, but I think that one is actually accessible to other people. All right, let's talk about uh, Bohemian matrices a little bit. So I've clicked on Bohemian matrix, the Bohemian matrix unit, and I want to point people to 
the gallery, bohemianmatrices.com, uh, has a gallery of what I think are beautiful images. What the, the relevance for this talk is that many of these pictures were produced by the students. In particular, this one here was done by Jonathan Brigno Tarasov, who was a, a first year student in, was he a first year student? No, maybe he was a senior student. He was a senior student in the, uh, the first iteration of the course. And uh, it's a lovely picture. Well, what is, what is it? What is this picture and how, how does it uh, arise? This is a plot in the complex plane of the eigenvalues of a sample of 5 million 15 by 15 circulant matrices. And the population of these matrices is minus one zero one. That is every entry of every one of those five million matrix matrices was either minus one, zero, or one, and the matrices had the circulant structure. All right, we just look at this plot and you see that the eigenvalues have a pattern. They're fairly smoothly distributed, but the pattern is completely visible. That pattern is, so far as I know, unexplained. So here's a picture drawn by an undergraduate student which is uh, presents you with an interesting puzzle right away. Okay, let's go back to the uh, to the book, the Jupiter book. So by the time we are here in this book, there's more code, there's more interesting because some of which we supply, others which we ask them to do. Uh, talk uh, have, this is one of the first connections with uh, randomness one of the things that's interesting to me about bohemian matrices is it's it, you get to do things exhaustively or randomly and so you can uh, begin to understand randomness a little bit uh, we begin with an introduction to matrices lightning introduction to matrices and link to a nice video from three blue one brown uh, that talks about the geometric interpretation of the, the determinant. There are absolutely tremendous educational resources available on YouTube. Now, uh, the math content providers like Stand Up Math and, and 3 Blue One Brown and uh, Online Kind and uh, lots of people are very, very much worth watching. And we really need to pay attention to some of these things. So anyway, what's a Bohemian matrix? We say that a set of matrices is a bohemian family. If all, of, oh, by the way, we can resize. I'll resize this a little bit here. Uh, and uh, so we say that a set of matrices is a bohemian family. If it's all the entries of each matrix A in the family from the same finite discrete population P. Population might be a finite set of integers, which is where the acronym came from, or it might be square root of minus one, it might be pi, key is that it's a discrete family and every or a discrete population and every matrix in the family has entries that are just from that population and that turns out to be a productive idea there have some interesting things that happen when we combine that with various matrix structures we show people how to uh, make these plots these plots are density plots of the eigenvalues. So you pick a number of pixels and then you compute a whole bunch of eigenvalues and then you count how many eigenvalues are occur in each pixel and then you colorize the pixel with uh, a hot color if there's a lot of eigenvalues in it and a cool color if there's not many eigenvalues or you leave it black if there's no eigenvalues in it and you get these pictures which show the structure of the eigenvalues of the family and it and provoke interesting questions. We don't know that we've got the optimal coloring scheme. We use a perceptually uniform coloring scheme uh, called uh, Viridis or Civitis. Those two coloring schemes were invented by the uh, some researchers at Python. They have a very nice discussion of, of how that all works. You can invent your own colors. Students might like to do that but that there's a lot of freedom uh, in here why do it if you just plot the eigenvalues you lose a lot of detail here's uh, a plot of a bunch of eigenvalues and because every point is plotted with finite size they overlap and you just lose the information whereas if you uh, 
plot that same image with a density plot, you can see the hot areas where there are more eigenvalues, and you can see the holes where there are none quite clearly. And some interesting questions that come up. Why is the shape a lozenge? Why have we got something cut off over here? I don't know why the answer to that one. I think I might be able to under explain that if I was careful, but I haven't looked at these. There are combinatorial questions that arise. There are linear algebra questions that might arise. There's just a thousand different kinds of questions that come up. And one of the things that we want uh, the students to do is look at to come up with their own questions as they said so we actually have in every unit we have a an activity where they have to think up lots of questions and if they want they can answer one of them but the more the important part of the activity is come up with their own, their own questions all right i am running out of time so i am going to go to my acknowledgements and uh just say that we're thankful to western university for a 2018 fellowship in teaching innovation uh, that funded the early development of this and there's lots and lots of people who helped a lot. Uh, Toby Driscoll told us about Jupyter Book, David Aralaya told us about Jupyter Notebooks and all my past students and my collaborators and of course John Borwin and Peter Borwin helped enormously and influenced me and influenced Neil uh, enormously uh, while they were here and we are very grateful that they were. Um, and with that, I end my talk. Thank you for listening.